Welcome to Victoria Citadel. Thank you for joining us today from your living room or wherever you are. It'll be a wonderful day when we can join together and enjoy each other's company again. And we're looking forward to that with hope. And uh, we may feel out of control, but we keep reminding ourselves that the Lord our God is in control and he's worthy of our trust. I want to remind you that if you need information on what's going on in the Salvation Army world, COVID, the Salvation Army THQ Sunday services, and the publications that we usually have in print, but which are not in print right now, you just have to go to salvationist.ca. And I would also like to thank you for continuing to send in your tithes and offerings. And I know that you're taking care of each other with calls and cards, and please keep doing that. Um, I was thinking, we have some cards here at the Citadel, so if you wanted to stop by and get some, and maybe a few stamps, that might help you out a little bit. Something to think about. All right, so today is Pentecost Sunday, which for the Jewish people is 50 days, Pente for five, after Passover. And the Christians, it is 50-ish days after the resurrection. So that's the reason that for the name Pentecost. And it's the day that God sent his spirit to fill his people. So I have a little story for you. Well, first I'll read the, the short scripture, not the text scripture. Acts chapter 2, starting at verse 1. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Well, as you can see, I have a balloon today. And you can have a lot of fun with a balloon. You know, if you get a long, skinny one, some people know how to twist them and they can turn them into animals or swords. Um, and sometimes people have round balloons and they have a contest of keeping it up in the air. Who can keep it up the longest? The balloon I'm holding is a very nice balloon. Um, but there's just something wrong with this balloon. Can you think what it is? Yeah, this balloon needs some air. It needs to be filled with air. Before the balloon can fill its purpose, it needs to be filled with air. Someone must breathe some life into it. So this balloon can help us learn something about the church. Today is a very special day that we call Pentecost. And it was the day that God sent his Holy Spirit to breathe life into his people so that they would be all that he wanted them to be. So, bear with me. Before God sent his Holy Spirit, the church was kind of lifeless like this balloon. They were still listening to Jesus' teaching, but they weren't going around and preaching the good news about Jesus the way they were supposed to. They weren't witnessing. That's what witnessing is, sharing good news about Jesus. So after the Holy Spirit breathed life into the church, then they began telling everyone they saw about Jesus. And it didn't even matter if they spoke the same language or not. People understood what they were saying, even though they couldn't speak the language of the people that were hearing them. It was a miracle. They heard the good news in their own languages. The fun part is always tying it off. The church became alive and started doing what God wanted them to do once they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, as we breathe life into our balloon, and the balloon needs to be filled in order to be doing what a balloon should be doing, we need the Holy Spirit to fill us. And then we can be good children of God and do what he wants us to do. He will give us the power and the love to do what he wants us to do. So let's pray. God, how we thank you for sending your Holy Spirit to fill us. Once we are filled, we know we can be used, and we will be powered by your love. We pray you will fill us and refill us, all for your glory. We pray for each other. For those who are fearful, we ask your peace. 
For those who are ill, we pray for your healing. For those who are lonely, we pray for a fresh sense of your love. Bless the leaders of our country and the Salvation Army. May they be led by your Spirit. And we pray this in the name of Jesus, our risen Savior. Song number 319 in our songbook says, For the mighty moving of thy spirit in our hearts and minds from day to day, for the gentle soothing of thy spirit when our fears had filled us with dismay, for the kindly chiding of thy spirit when we thought to find an easier way, for the gracious guiding of thy spirit and the strength we needed to obey, for the tender stirring of thy spirit, who recalled us when we went astray, the persistent spurring of thy spirit when we hesitated on the way. We adore thee, Heavenly Father, and we thank thee, Heavenly Father, and we praise thee, Heavenly Father, as we pray. Hello, everyone. We are reading from the book of Daniel. Uh, chapter 3, verses 1 through 18. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold, 90 feet high and 9 feet wide, and set it on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. He then summoned the satrap, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other provincial officials to come to the dedication of the image he had set up. So the satrap, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other provincial officials assembled for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and they stood before it. Then the herald, then the herald loudly proclaimed, This is what you command to do, O people, nations, and men of every language. As soon as you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipes, and all kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. Therefore, as soon as they heard the sound of the horn, the zither, flyer, harp, and all kinds of music, all the peoples, nations, and men of every language fell down and worshipped the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. At this time, some astrologers came forward and announced the, Jew, the announced the Jews. Then said to King Nebuchadnezzar, O King, live forever. You have issued, issued, issued the decree, O King, that everyone who hears the sound of a horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music must fall down and worship the image of gold and that whoever does not fall down in worship will be thrown into a blazing furnace. But there are some Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, your majesty. They, ne they neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you have set up. Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my God or worship the image of gold I have set up? Now when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then, what God will be able to rescue from my hand? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. So, with that, we'd like to say hi, we miss you, and we'll see you soon from Connie, Aaron, 
Miranda, Nava, Erica, and Jesse. Bye for now. Bye. And our Well, good morning, folks. It's good to be with you again. This may be the last recording from this particular location as uh, books are being packed, and so we'll have to find another location from which to film. But uh, we'd like to thank uh, Trevor and Chris for the song, How From a Foundation, as we turn our focus now to the Word of God. The worst case scenario survival handbook is a manual based on interviews with experts in a variety of fields. The book has short chapters on things like how to escape from quicksand or how to jump from a building into a dumpster, uh, how to perform an emergency tracheotomy on one of your friends should you need to. The book was a bestseller. It sold over 10 million copies worldwide and some of the advice is quite predictable. For example, in the section on how to deal with a charging bull, the number one rule is don't antagonize the bull. Seems fairly obvious. But other advice is quite surprising. For example, there's a chapter on how to survive if your parachute does not open. First, they suggest signal to a jumping companion. Now, what's interesting here is they don't say what to do if you're not with a jumping companion, but signal to a jumping companion whose chute is not already open that you're having trouble. And when your companion, your new best friend, gets to you, hook arms. You'll be falling at a terminal velocity of about 200 kilometers per hour. Open the chute. 
the shock of opening the chute will be severe, probably enough to dislocate your shoulders. You may hit the ground slowly enough to only break a leg, but your chances of survival are quite high. So now that you have a sense of what the book is about, I want to test you and your survival skills to see just how savvy you are. So this one's right out of the book. How can you survive in water where surface oil is burning? I'm going to give you three options and you'll pick the one you deem to be the best. Option A, swim face down close to the surface and vigorously move your arms and legs to protect yourself from the flames. Option B, swim underwater, surfacing for air head first and move your arms in a large sweeping motion to disperse the flames. Option C, to take a breath, move in a somersault motion, rotating your body around to splash with your feet to break up the flames. Okay, which answer did you choose? Option A, B, or C? Well, if you chose answer B, you would be correct. Swim underwater, surfacing for air head first, and move your arms in a large circular or sweeping motion to disperse the flames. Now, the author tells us that the principle behind writing his book, The Worst Case Scenario Survival Handbook, is a simple one. And I quote, you just never really know what curves life will throw at you, what is lurking around the corner. You never really know what might, you might be called upon uh, to choose between life or death with your actions. But when you all are called upon, you need to know what to do. That's why this book was written, end of quote. Well, today we're going to be looking at another worst case scenario to see how real life people responded to a real life or death situation. So I invite you to open your Bibles to Daniel 3, the reading that was shared with you earlier by Connie Aaron and family. And now if you were with us last week, you'll know that at the end of chapter 2, Daniel was the only one who could tell Nebuchadnezzar what his dream was and what his dream meant. He dreamt of a large statue with a head of pure gold, chest and arms of silver, belly and thigh of bronze, and legs of iron with feet of iron mixed with baked clay. His dream meant that there were three other kingdoms to follow his. But the centerpiece of the dream was the kingdom of God, a kingdom that would never be destroyed, a kingdom that would crush all other kingdoms and bring them to an end. So at the end of chapter 2, after the king had been told what the dream was and what it meant, Nebuchadnezzar says to Daniel, Surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings. Well, we don't know how much time has elapsed since then, but now it seems, as we begin chapter 3, that Nebuchadnezzar has a very selective memory. He seems to have conveniently forgot about the God of heaven, the God of gods and his enduring kingdom, but he does seem to remember the head of pure gold representing his kingdom. He may have thought about how his own kingdom, represented by that head of gold, stands on feet of iron mixed with baked clay, two elements that don't mix well, and which makes his and all the other kingdoms so very vulnerable. Perhaps that's why he commissions the image, the construction of that image, which symbolizes his desire that no kingdom should destroy his, not even the kingdom of the God of gods, the God of Daniel. He wants to ensure that his kingdom will last forever. Now, because his kingdom consists of captured peoples from different nations, languages, and cultures, he decides that what he needs for his kingdom to endure is unity. If his kingdom were united, it would be invincible. No kingdom, not even the kingdom of the God of Daniel, he may have thought, would then be able to break it up and destroy it. 
So how better to create that desired unity than by having this dedication ceremony of the image he had set up. Now there is something megal megalomaniacal about Nebuchadnezzar's desire for a statue, notably its size and shape. In verse 1 of Daniel 3, we learn that it's 28 meters high and almost 3 meters wide. It's layered with pure gold set up on the plain of Dura. Dura sounds like some place in Middle Earth, doesn't it? Actually, Dura was a suburb of Babylon. And interestingly enough, it was in the same area where the Tower of Babel was built. It may be that the image represented Nebuchadnezzar himself. We're not totally sure, but it is what megalomaniacs often do, isn't it? I mean, who can forget the sight of the statue of Saddam Hussein, another megalomaniac, being pulled down in Baghdad, which is only 85 kilometers south of ancient Babylon, back in 2003. Even today, totalitarian states like China have, since Mao, used a visual symbol of unity with the pictures or statues of their dictator, to which homage must be paid if you want to progress in that communist society, or in some cases even stay alive. Well, as king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar is doing the same kind of thing with this image of gold he's had built. In fact, he seems to have shared in the hubris of the people of Babel when motivated to build a tower in this same location back in Genesis 11 in order to make a name for themselves. The arrangements for this statue's unveiling are full of religious overtones. There is a dedication ceremony with all the important government officials and dignitaries present from around the empire, we learn in verse 2, along with the finest sounding band for musical accompaniment, we learn in verse 5, even if the pipes mentioned there were an early form of bagpipes. Well, when the music starts, that's the signal for the people to bow down and worship the image of gold that the king has set up as a sign of their unity pledged in loyalty to the king. Now it's worth noting as well that King Nebuchadnezzar also decreed in verse 6 that failure to comply with this command to bow down and worship the image meant that you would be thrown alive into a fiery furnace. These furnaces were industrial-sized kilns, really, kiln ovens used for the firing of bricks. So picture this moment. A vast assembly of countless delegates summoned to attend the dedication of the image that the king had set up. I could imagine it would be something like the opening ceremony of the Olympic Games. The music begins to play, and the gathered delegates, representatives of peoples, nations, and every language in the kingdom are highly motivated, due to the king's decree, to bow down flat on their faces and worship this image as a united display of their loyalty to the king. I can imagine the king saying, ah, yes, now we are achieving the unity I so desperately desire. But did he really? Look at verse 8. In Daniel 3, at this time, some astrologers, this is a group who were part of the king's advisors, came forward and denounced the Jews. The Aramaic word, keratz, translated as denounced, literally means to maliciously accuse or to slander as in, and is intended to convey an intense sense of hostility. They declare to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. And they go on to remind him of the decree he's issued, that everyone is to bow down and worship the golden image. So now go down to verse 12. They go on to say, There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Let's pause there for a moment. Why did these advisors of the king have such an intense hostility towards these three young Jewish men? Could it be they were motivated out of professional jealousy? 
If you remember back in chapter 1, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Daniel all graduated summa cum laude, top of their class, were found, according to the king, to be ten times better than all the other advisors. And then in chapter 2, they were promoted and appointed as the lead administrators over the province of Babylon. So could it be that these advisors are making such malicious accusations against these Jewish boys because they themselves have been passed over for promotion and placed under the authority of these young men, these captured Jews. Could it be they're now thinking, ah, this is our chance to bring them down? Well, if you've been tracking with us in this series, you know uh, by now Nebuchadnezzar, uh, something about him, and uh, could maybe even predict what his reaction might be. Look at verse 13. He does not disappoint. Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summons these three young men and offers them one last chance to recant. If they refuse to recant, he says in verse 15, with the arrogance fueled by his own megalomania, you'll be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? So here the king declares his own power above all the gods, even the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Well, how will these three young men respond when facing this, their worst case scenario? Well, perhaps catching the king off guard, they say in verse 16, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us from it, and he will rescue us from your hand, O king. Wow. These three young men calmly, boldly proclaim their faith in the God of heaven without a moment's hesitation. Their courageous faith is really quite remarkable. Understand, they do not seek death, but neither do they shirk it? When facing their worst case scenario, they refuse to betray or recant their faith in the God of heaven, the God they serve, even though they may die for taking this stand. Why? Because, as the text tells us, they are convinced that the God they serve is able to save them. I don't know if it's possible for us to spend too much time reflecting on stories that teach this remarkable truth that the God we serve is able. He is able to save us even when facing our worst case scenarios in life. For example, the God we serve is able to mend fractured relationships. The God we serve is able to free people from addictions. The God we serve is able to heal damaged bodies. The God we serve is able to forgive our darkest sin. The God we serve is able to provide for our greatest need, able to soften the hardest heart, able to bring the runaway rebel back home. The God we serve is able to see us through this pandemic. The God we serve is able. Sear that into your consciousness. The God we serve is able. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are facing their worst-case scenario. Their parachutes have not opened, and they will not open. But listen to what they go on to say in verse 18. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us from it, and he will rescue us from your hand, O king. But, highlight, circle, underline that conjunction, but... But even if he does not, we want you to know, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. In other words, in the face of this worst-case scenario, even if God does not save us, we will march to our deaths singing songs of praise to the only God that we will ever serve and love. No matter what the result, deliverance or death, they are going to stay faithful to the God of heaven. 
Now this, of course, has tremendous implications for how we think when facing our worst case scenarios. Our God is an awesome God and he is able to save us from our worst case scenarios. But what if he does not? We need to ask ourselves the question, is my devotion to God from one day to the next contingent on just getting from God what I want, what I pray for? We need to think about Job, who refuses to dishonor God despite intense suffering day in, day out with no relief and no explanation, and yet is able to say these amazing words in Job 13, though he slay me, though God slay me, yet I will hope in him. Or think of Esther, who decided she would confront a tyrant king on behalf of her people, the Jewish people, even though it could mean her death. I will go to the king, she says in Esther 4, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Think of our Christian brothers and sisters in places like China who are being imprisoned, even executed for their faith in Jesus. Or to bring it even closer to home, think of the man whose wife is battling with cancer. He tenaciously clings to the hope that God is able to heal her. But what about the even if he does not part of the equation? This man would give up anything, his business, his money, his home, his health, just to have this one prayer answered. And for reasons none of us will ever be able to understand, it is not. And yet through a flow of tears, he is able to say, even if I have to give her up, I will not let go of God. Will you hold on to God? Will you stay faithful to him even if he does not save you from your worst case scenario? Maybe your worst case scenario involves a relationship with someone who is battling with cancer or ALS or Alzheimer's. Maybe, some, maybe your worst case scenario involves someone who is dealing with depression or other mental health issues because of the coronavirus. Maybe your worst case scenario involves the fracturing of a friendship that you've long cherished. Maybe your worst case scenario involves the impending death of a loved one who has contracted SARS-2. Maybe your worst case scenario involves a job loss and the financial stress that that brings on your family because of the pandemic. Know that the God we serve is able he is able to save you from your worst case scenario. But even if he does not, will you, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, stay faithful to him? I'm going to invite you to listen to the words of a song by General uh, John Gowans as we conclude today. And again, thank Trevor, Brian, and Chris for this peace. If crosses come, I pray that uh, these words will express the desire of your heart. Stay faithful to Christ. God bless you.